Thank you for joining our church online. We encourage you to visit citylightla.church for our service times, location, and upcoming events. If you enjoy our videos and would like to give to lives being changed in Los Angeles, visit citylightla.church slash give. I want to invite you this morning to open up to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5 this morning. Galatians chapter 5 will be down in verse 16, down to verse 26. <clears throat> but if you do not own a copy of God's Word, maybe on an app or a physical copy, then I want to invite you to take one of the hardback Bibles that are in the seat rack uh, somewhere in front of you. Uh, you can take one of those Bibles and open up to page 916. 916 in those hardback Bibles will be there in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse number 16. As I was studying this text and uh, asking uh, Pastor Nick for some help here, um, I was reminded of the first time that uh, my family and I took a trip, a vacation to El Salvador. Uh, so growing up, my family, their idea of a family vacation, the only idea, it seemed, <laughs> of a family vacation uh, that was possible for us was to go to El Salvador. Uh, both my parents are Salvadorian by origin, and uh, uh, but I was raised and born in New York, and um, they decided, well, I think it's time for us to take our first trip as a family to El Salvador for vacation. And uh, my dad had the bold and crazy idea of taking that trip by car. Yep, from New York all the way to El Salvador. And so my dad and my uncle got two pickup trucks and my three-year-old sister and myself, I was seven at the time, packed those pickup trucks with a bunch of stuff to give to our friends and family back in El Salvador and we hit the road. And I gotta tell you, it was one of the most memorable trips of my life. I love that trip. And everything was going great until we hit Mexico. <laughs> that's not a dig, that's not, that's not a, a bash on Mexico. Mexico's great. However, what happened in Mexico was that one of the trucks broke down. And so here we were, stuck in Mexico with no real way to get this half of our stuff over to El Salvador. And so my dad and uncle scrambled the next three days while my sister and I were just like playing somewhere in the town square and looking for someone who would be willing to guide us, to lead us over to El Salvador and take half of our stuff for us. And so thankfully they, well, maybe not thankfully, uh, they found someone. They found someone who said, yeah, I've got a truck. Uh, you can pack your things in my car. I know the way there. Uh, you can follow me and I'll take you. And so uh, my dad and uncle decided, all right, well, wh what's left to do? Let's trust this guy. Well, bad, <laughs> it was a bad decision. It was a bad choice. <laughs> because when we took, took off and hit the road, uh, I remember uh, that first day was perfectly fine. We drove through the day and, and we rested at night. Uh, but the next day, uh, my, uh, th this guy decided to uh, uh, recommend, hey, you know, we're almost there. Why don't, we, why don't we drive through the night? And my uncle and dad decided, okay, sure, let's do it. The first day went well. All right. I guess it was all part of his plan because as we drove at night, uh, he began to drive a lot faster until eventually we lost him. And so there went um, a good chunk of money and half of our stuff. My beef with it was that my bike was in his truck. <laughs> and so I share that story with you because if you've ever had to follow the leadership of someone, if you ever had to follow a leader who ultimately was out to do you harm, you know that it can leave you in a pretty dark lost and vulnerable place. And the reality of what Paul is trying to present to us in today's text is this, that we are all being led by something or someone. And there are forces, the reality is, is that there are forces trying to lead us to ultimately do us harm. These are forces hell-bent on leaving us empty and in despair. But there is one person out to lead us, to guide us, 
to the greatest of joys, to the most fulfilling of happiness and the most greatest of loves, our ultimate good, that is the Holy Spirit of God. And he wants to lead us to that church. Which brings us to our text this morning here in Galatians chapter 5, starting verse 16. If you read it with me, follow along with me there in your Bible, starting verse 16, the Bible says this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. <clears throat> For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. If you've been tracking with us for the last few months, then you know we have been working through the book of Galatians passage by passage, studying it, and breaking it down verse by verse. And as you may remember, the church of Galatia had fallen prey to several false teachers and some sin issues. And as a result, it had caused them to diminish the value and power of the gospel, which is where we get our title of our series that there is no other gospel. And with this letter that Paul is writing to them, Paul expounds on their issues here in this text when Paul wanted them to understand that through this portion of the text that the real enemy, the real enemy they're facing are not the false teachers, but it's their own flesh. Their inner selves. That they're being led astray into failure by their own selves. And as Pastor Nick shared with us last week, we're all prone to fail, but the solution is still the same. Our deliverance is in Jesus. His grace frees us. And as we'll discover in today's passage, His Spirit leads us. Which brings us to the big idea of this text this morning. The big idea is simply our statement and our best attempt to try and capture this passage in a sentence. And here it is for you this morning. The big idea for today's message is this. The Christian life requires the Holy Spirit's leadership. The Christian life requires the Holy Spirit's leadership. And so if we're approaching this text and trying to study it well, one question we might ask is, in what direction is the Spirit trying to lead me to? Or where is the Spirit trying to lead me to? And so from this text, we can gather at least two directions or paths or decisions that the Spirit is trying to lead us to. And so the way we want to answer that question is this. The Spirit leads me to. And so I just have two for you this morning. Hopefully we'll be out of here sooner than later, but here they are, the two. The Spirit leads me to break free from the grip of the flesh, to break free from the grip of the flesh. Paul is coming here off of the heels of his warning to the Galatians in verses 2 through 15, as we learned last week. The Galatians have embraced religion and tradition so harshly that they've become antagonistic, nasty, and hypocritical towards each other. They war and bicker with each other, and the gospel is now being presented amongst themselves and to the outside world as something that is divisive and of no use to the rest of the world. Well, it's been 2,000 years, and the church still struggles with these things. We're still no different. We're still broken people that struggle to be unified to present the gospel in such a way that is sincere and honest and genuine. But the solution remains the same as it did back then, it does today. The Spirit of God is a builder and beautifier of His church. He is the one who changes a person from living in such a way that is contrary to Jesus and the freedom He died for. 
Paul explains this very succinctly here in verse 16. Verse 16, he says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The word walk there would have been understood by the Hebrew minds in those days as a friendship term. Uh, probably the minds of the hearers of Paul would have gone back to Genesis chapter 2 as it spoke of how Adam and God walked together in the garden. This is a term, this is a term about friendship and communion. However, if we look deeper into it, into the original language, what you'll find is that it's written in the passive voice. This is what it means. Passive voice simply means that this is, pro- this is something that is being done through the power or will of another. So let me explain it this way. What does he mean by walk in the Spirit? The way I like to explain it is in the same way how my two-year-old walks around whenever we're out and about. See, when my son learned how to walk, I am doing and, and try to make sure that he walked as much as possible. And with that, Um, as boys, I guess, do, uh, want to walk on all of these surfaces that are pretty risky or dangerous. And so he likes to walk on the benches and likes to walk on the curb and likes to walk on all these things where he could potentially hurt himself. And you know what? I let him. I let him walk on those things. Now, before you start judging me as a bad parent, I let him walk on those things but while holding my hand the whole way. Because ultimately, the destination where we're going to isn't up to him, but also his safety and care isn't up to him. It's up to me. And he walks with my guiding and directional hand in his as I take him to the places where we need to go. That is the way the Spirit walks with us. When we walk in the Spirit, we walk with his directional hand in ours, guiding us, caring for us, and sealing us for the place and the direction God wants us to go. But before we move on, I think it's important for us to at the very least define this one term that we tend to throw around pretty frequently as Christians. And if you've been around the church or been around other Christians and you've heard this term of the flesh. And Paul uses this term very frequently and sometimes interchangeably between his body and this other thing. And so what I want for us today is just give a quick definition to help us keep track here of where we're going in this text. And here's how we define it. The flesh is any human action or inhibition or achievement without dependence upon or in defiance of the Holy Spirit and without glorying in Christ Jesus. Let me put it much simply for you. The flesh is that part of us that wants to live independent of God and his desire for our lives. It is that part of us that wants to break free from God and what he wants for us. That is the flesh. And so if we can put verses 16's promise in even simpler terms, we could say this. The Spirit leads us away from defying God. Hey, if if you're following the Spirit, the Spirit's going to lead you away from defying God. And Paul further explains the nature of the flesh in the following verses in verses 17 and 18. Look with me again. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. See, both the flesh and the Spirit have desires. It's a lot like two boxers in a ring. Two boxers in a ring, their goal is to knock the other person out. It's to fight and jab and hit each other until the other person is on the ground and unable to move anymore. That is how our desires are competing against each other. And if you've ever had to face knowing you need to do the right thing and unable to actually do it, then you know what Paul is talking about here. Another way Paul puts it here in Romans 17, in Romans 7, excuse me, verse 18 and 19, he says this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. You see, there is a war inside of us that is tugging, gnawing, jabbing at us to fulfill the desires of one and reject the other. 
It is a war of desires. As one scholar put it, the fight of Christian liberty is not fought on the level of external behavior, but upon inner desire. When we fight this fight of the Christian faith, we don't fight it on how we behave to the outside world. We fight it first internally. That is the battleground. But it doesn't take much for us to recognize that this kind of struggle is debilitating. If you've ever been in the situation where you know the Spirit's guiding you to do something, but your flesh wants to do this other thing, you know it can be tiring. You feel restless. You feel conflicted. Unable to decide where to go, what to do. But the Bible tells us freedom from the struggle is available. Freedom is found in the leadership of the Holy Spirit, church family. When Paul says we're not under the law, he is saying we're not bound by the demands and expectations of tradition, society, religion, or culture. We are free to live the most joyful and happy of lives, a life that is lived in pursuit of Jesus. Paul further explains this idea in the following verse, verses in verses 19 through 21. Look with me again. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, <clears throat> idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. For the sake of sticking to the point of this message, I'm not going to define and explain each one of these 13 works of the flesh. What I would encourage you to do is take this list and study it for yourself. Look at it, see the original language and how it applies to our modern context today or maybe how you're facing and struggling with them today. But what is important for you and I to know is that this list of works of the flesh, that there isn't a single person in here, there isn't a single church on the face of the planet or in history that hasn't struggled in some capacity with one of these things. There isn't. And this isn't even an exhaustive list. These aren't all of the sins in the world. These are just 13 of them. And yet, there isn't a single person that hasn't struggled at some point with one of these things. If you're pushing back on it, again, I encourage you, study this for yourself and see what these words actually mean in the original language. In fact, we can almost assume that the Galatians were in large part struggling with each of these things since Paul put them here. And look, I, I, I'm sure that if you heard of another church in town that was facing some of these things, the natural bent we have is to judge them and say, man, that church is messed up over there. But let me tell you something. We're not perfect either. We have our own struggles here too. We have sin struggles here too. But the difference is how we confront them. How are we going to face them? How are we going to find deliverance from them? And here is a warning that Paul gives us. That those who do these things will not inherit God's kingdom. Now, I should caution you that the word do there means to make a practice of. This is not oh, I messed up one time, I relapsed, and man, I, I feel awful about it. And no longer will God forgive me and I'm out of heaven for good. No, that's not what he means here. What this means is that this is someone who is going on and practicing this in such a way that is openly and consciously, maybe even ignorantly, defiant towards God. That's the difference. And so know that difference. But when we read this, this term will not inherit the kingdom of God, we could interpret it very least, at least in two ways. One is interpreted through the lens of salvation. The Bible is very clear when Jesus refers to inheriting the kingdom of God as a term of, hey, if you practice these things or you do these things or you live this way, then you will not get to heaven someday. And that is true. Jesus even says that you will know them by their fruits. And so we can interpret it that way. But another way we might interpret it is also that 
those who go and practice these things will not benefit the kingdom of God, will not be of any use to the kingdom of God. One scholar defines the kingdom of God this way, God's reign through God's people over God's place. Meaning the kingdom of God exists wherever God's people are at, obeying his word and spreading the gospel for the benefit of that place. You know what that means, church family? That means that the kingdom of God is here in Burbank. That means the kingdom of God is here in Los Angeles. Whatever bad or low opinion you have about the place where we call, which we call home, God has brought his kingdom here. Why? Because he has sovereignly and lovingly put you here. And as long as you are here, the kingdom of God is here. But mark it down. When we live after the works of the flesh, the kingdom of God is obscured and pushed aside. Because living in practice of these things will only leave you broken, unfulfilled, and empty. Because the flesh is a miserable and terrible leader. But there is another leader, and there's another kingdom. That is the kingdom of heaven, and his king is Jesus. He says that the only way to true joy is to break free from the grip of the flesh and live after his kingdom. In his kingdom, he promises purpose, joy, and freedom, the likes of which you could never find anywhere else. And praise God for that. And so the question is, how do we do that? How do we break free from the grip of the flesh? Well, the language Paul uses here suggests that breaking free from the grip of the flesh requires communion and obedience to Jesus. Because here's the thing. If we reject Christ, then we reject the one that could have led us away and freed us from this flesh. So the call is very simple. Turn to Christ. Accept your need for him. Repent of your sin and trust him to deliver you. This is what the Spirit leads us to. So we said the Spirit leads me to break free from the grip of the flesh. Secondly, the Spirit leads me to expressly submit to Christ. If the Spirit leads us to break free from something, then logic would follow that the Spirit leads us to embrace something. And this is what Paul sets out to describe in the following verses. And he begins by giving us a holistic view of this thing called the fruit of the Spirit, which is essentially God's character towards his creation. But what I want you to understand and catch this, that the, the way that Paul describes this is he describes it in the singular form. He says the fruit of the Spirit. This further implies that these are elements that are all part of each other. This, this is a unified thing. All of these elements are not disconnected, where one person is probably more loving, another person is more joyful, and that other person is more patient, and then that's just how it's going to be. No, but rather that each one of these elements that Paul sets out to describe here and list for us are all elements that are available and attainable for us. Meaning that there isn't a single thing on this list where you might say, that's just not me. I can't be that. Because if the Spirit of God is living in you, then the reality is this, that you can be all of these things because the Spirit gives you the power to do so. And so let's read it together here in verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, I normally... Uh, it, it would be incumbent of me to define each one of these terms and each one of these elements, but I'm sure for most of you who maybe grew up in church or maybe are experts in human virtue, you might think that that might be a little redundant. And so I'm not gonna list them in such a way where I'm defining each one of them, but rather what I'd like to do is list them and tag on a question that I hope stirs your conscience like it did mine and help you see where this lands in your own life. And so I want you to see this with me. Here are the nine elements of the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Do you labor for the good of your brothers and sisters? 
Do you labor for the good of your brothers and sisters? This is not looking to do good in the subtle hopes that will be repaid to you when you need it, but a good that is expressed with no expectation or demand to exert one's rights. Saying, I'm going to love you, doesn't matter what you can give back to me. I'm not going to wait until I'm do, in, a, in a hard position later on and expect you to love me because I loved you already. No, I'm going to love you regardless. Joy. Do you delight in the Christ-likeness of God's people? Now, naturally, joy in the Lord is foremost, but it overflows to all who are being remade in His image. So, do you get excited when you hear of someone who's turned to faith here at this church family? When we baptized three individuals last week, did that bring a sense of joy to your heart? Or were you just waiting to get out of the service to eat lunch? Does it excite you when someone says, hey, I got saved. Hey, I'm, I let go of that thing. God is changing me. Does that excite you? Does that bring you joy? Peace, do you strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit even at significant personal cost? See, the Holy Spirit brings together people that would have never be found dead in a place together. But, no matter how different we may be from the person across the room, in Christ we're all one body, we're one flesh, and one day we'll go up to live in one heaven and one home. And if not for Christ, then there would be nothing that we would find in common, nothing that we'd want to have in common with each other, but thankfully, I look out at this crowd and it's a mixed bag, and I'm thankful that no matter what age or background or nationality or color you are, that we can come together in the unity and the peace of the Spirit. Patience. Are you growing in your ability to overlook offenses? This is not just sitting calmly in traffic, but looking at an offense that's been flung right at your face and overlook it. One application we might take from this is simply when you are working with someone who is struggling in their faith or struggling with some sort of sin and they continue to fall and they continue to persist in their bad decisions and you are tempted to just give in and say, they need to be out, they, I need to give up on them, I've wasted my time, but rather saying, no, I'm gonna keep on walking with them even if they fail, even if they keep on falling to the same thing again and again, trusting and believing that one day they're gonna be made into the image of Christ patience, kindness. Do not only overlook offenses, but also repay them with love. See, it's one thing to receive an offense and a whole other thing to repackage it and send it forward as a blessing. That's what kindness is. Goodness, do you dream up opportunities to be helpful? Just as no one can stay under a waterfall and stay dry, no one can gaze at Jesus and stay useless. I'll say that again. Just as no one can stay under a waterfall and stay dry, no one can look at Jesus and stay useless. As spirit-led people, we long to be used in the service of our King. We long to use our gifts and use ourselves to serve our King. And so, do you dream up opportunities to be helpful? Faithfulness. Do you do what you say you'll do, even the smallest matters? Can you be depended on in the smallest things from getting on time to work or personal commitments? Can you be trusted to be honest with your time and your effort? Gentleness, do you use your strength to serve the weak? When a person fails or falls, is your initial response outrage and anger and vitriol? But I would caution you that that probably and most definitely reveals more your self-righteousness, self-interest, and your Phariseeism, than anything else. But gentleness requires a humility that recognizes the fragility of the human spirit and the tender hand of our Lord. And self-control. Do you refuse your flesh's cravings? Is the driving force of your actions and words governed by the precious commands and promises of his word? These are the elements of the fruit of the spirit. But these are actions and elements that can only be produced by the spirit of God. We cannot do it on our own. 
We can't white knuckle our way to doing these things, being more loving, being more patient, being more joyful, being more good, being more kind, being more self-controlled. We cannot do it, church family. This is only something that can be done by the Spirit of God living inside of us and leading us to do these things. Only Christ moving in us can materialize these things in tangible actions. And so, when he says, against these things there is no law, in other words, he's saying there's no restraint or opposition. These actions are the natural outpouring of the person who has expressly submitted to Christ. There's nothing standing in your way. There's nothing that should keep you from living in the Spirit, because if you submit to the leadership of the Spirit, this is just what comes out. This is just the way that you are. If we allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit completely, then there's no law or restraint that can be put on us that can keep us from living completely and entirely after the kingdom of God. Because we're free. We're free. And Paul further explains that this kind of person naturally does something to get there. This is not a law thing, but rather what the Spirit does in us. These are actions we do from an identity of being led by the Spirit. And so what does it say here in verse 24? And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. In verse 24, he tells us to crucify the flesh. This means to pin down the things and desires that are leading us away from God in such a way that might seem painful but is necessary. Because God deserves our full allegiance, church family, and that means that if we're going to give him our full allegiance and submit to him and his leadership completely, then that means we have to give some things up. That might mean letting go of a relationship, putting up parameters uh, around your social life, or maybe even putting up restrictions on your phone and computer, taking a financial loss, having a hard conversation. Whatever that looks like for you, crucify it. Kill it. Because The pain of having to endure the consequences of living after the flesh are far more painful and unbearable than crucifying the thing that would have led us away from God after all. It's not worth it. Let it die. If Christ was willing to give up and crucify himself for our sins, then we should be willing to crucify our sins for his sake. So, But Paul then goes in verse 25 and he says, if we live in the spirit, which we could understand it has been made alive by the spirit. So if you've been saved, you've been regenerated by the spirit, then we ought to keep in step with the spirit. The word keep in step is interesting because it could be understood in our modern vernacular as keep rank. If you've served in the military, then that phrase is very familiar to you. And I reached out to a couple of friends to help me understand this word a bit better for someone who didn't serve in the military. And they gave me a lot of connotations and a lot of different thoughts to help me understand this better. And so I want to share that with you. And so essentially, in essence, keeping rank simply means to stay in formation of what has been commanded to you by your lead officer. Now, what's interesting to me is the details that these friends gave me about this idea That this requires you to be attentive, submissive, unselfish, and loyal to your commanding officer. Otherwise, you run the risk of not just demeaning their authority, but you run the risk of putting your fellow soldiers in harm's way and jeopardizing the whole mission. So when Paul tells us we need to keep in step, this is an act of submission. If we were to see the Spirit lead us to expressly submit to Christ, We have to accept the fact that we have a place, we have a rank, we must abide in. There is a place in the formation that we need to step along and follow the rhythm of our leading officer, our commander. And our commander is Jesus. We must follow that. There is no alternative because the spirit cannot lead where there's no allegiance to Christ. And what does this look like? Well, one mentor once told me this when talking about, well, how do we follow the spirit? How do we listen to the spirit? Simple. You just follow every prompt the Spirit gives you. And so, let me give you an example. If you feel in your heart that God is impressing upon you to invite a friend, then do it. If God is impressing upon you to reach out to a coworker or a friend and just talk with them and help them with something, then do it. 
if God is impressing upon you to give a little bit more than usual, then do it. Submitting to Christ, following the leadership of the Spirit, means we obey every impulse the Spirit gives us. That's what it means to keep in step, to follow every step, every beat, every rhythm our leader gives us. Because in the end, it's Him who's leading us. And oftentimes we fail to be everything God wants us to be because we ignore the orders when they come and still we're surprised by our lack of change. The Spirit cannot lead where there's no allegiance to Christ. And so Paul closes out this thought with this verse here in verse 26. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Here's what Paul's trying to say. And at the end of the day, any of this is, an enti- is entirely a work of Christ, is entirely a work of the Spirit. There's nothing you or I could do to get ourselves better or transform or any of it. Only God can do this. And so the only thing special about us, the only thing special about the next person, no matter how good you think you are or how holy you think the next person is, the only special thing about us is that we're loved by an amazing and beautiful Savior who gifted us his spirit to guide us and lead us through this life as we struggle along. And so, let's follow his lead. He's worthy, amen? No one else knows you more, has forgiven you more, has given up more, has loved you more, or is after your heart and affection more than Jesus. And now he's gifted you his spirit to lead you in this life. And so let's follow his lead. So the big idea The Christian life requires the Holy Spirit's leadership. And we said the two directions that the Spirit leads me to are to break free from the grip of the flesh and expressly submit to Christ. And so as we leave here this morning, I want to give to you three questions that I hope challenge your conscience and just help you to think how to apply this passage to your life during this week. And so here we go. First one. How much of yourself belongs to Christ? Jesus deserves all of you. But before you say, he already has all of me, I would challenge you to really think about this. Because if you're depending on anything else other than Jesus to take you to heaven someday, then let me tell you something. You're not depending completely on Christ. Christ does not have all of you. And if you're a Christian in here, and you think that you can white-knuckle your way, you can read the Bible more, you can pray more, you can go to church more, and you'll become better then Christ doesn't have all of you because you're depending on something else to take you along in this life. You don't belong all to him, so let's give it all to him. Secondly, what element of your spiritual growth have you been depending on your own effort to fulfill? This is ironic because in the Christian life, There are so many commands, there are so many things that we're called to live by, and yet God tells us again that they're impossible for you. And he does that on purpose because he wants us to understand that's no amount of discipline or self-effort that will make you or I any holier. You might think that you're doing good, but at some point the truth will reveal that in reality we're all just a bunch of self-interested, self-righteous people just doing things for us and us alone. But the Spirit's way is different. And he tells us that if we submit to him, we can live the life God is calling us to live and truly grow spiritually. Only dependence on the Spirit can lead us to do that. And so, what element of your spiritual growth have you been depending on your own effort to fulfill? And then lastly, how will you encourage others to walk in the Spirit? How will you encourage others to walk in the Spirit? Paul was going out on a limb here, writing this letter in hopes that the Galatians would listen and in hopes that they would change, that they would submit to Christ's authority and submit to the gospel. You know what? We have the same call too, to encourage one another when we see each other falling and failing and falling behind, that we'll come alongside and say, hey, it's all right. Let's keep going. This thing is worth it. 
And so church family, I want you to think for a moment. Think this week. Who can you encourage to walk in the Spirit? Let's pray together.